Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here, and I decided to do something different uh, this week. In fact, I thought about doing a Blu-ray review as its celebration of its 30th anniversary. I got the movie Manhunter Collector's Edition from Screen Factory. That's um, an imprint from Shell Factory. It's a two-disc set that has both the theatrical cut and the director's cut. And this is the main reason to get this because even though I was going to get the film from Anchor Bay, but since they finally uh, ported all the extras from the Anchor Bay release, I don't have to deal with it now. But there's still maybe one missing because there are a few things that should have been included, but that's okay. But this is a very nice set. I mean, they actually created a new uh, cover art for this. I thought it's really clever that they did it. Because it almost looks more like you want to see more of the characters in this film. Than what you saw in the, uh, the original theatrical poster and all these other ones they have. Which is actually underneath it, by the way. So yeah, you can see the back right here. And the spine. Yeah, both sides too. Yeah, it just looks really neat. Now, Shell Factory's uh, Screen Factory um, releases for collector's edition, they always keep coming up with um, a lot of artwork like this. You know, a lot of they also created a lot of that for all their titles. So it looks really interesting. I mean, because you know they wanted to make it look more unique in a way and. Make it more like an, a 70s and 80s style feel to it, where you get to see all the, the characters all in one frame, and you see all the images right here. I, I thought that was cool that they did this. So uh, underneath it there, there's a irreversible cover art, which includes the, um, the original theatrical poster. Yeah, this is the one I really prefer, because this is the one I remember seeing when the movie came out in theaters and and I've seen this poster many times uh, as I looked online you know where they show uh, Will Graham and and they, you can see uh, Will Graham with the flashlight trying to check inside the house you know where the killer has been which is of course uh, Francis Dollahide aka the Tooth Fairy and okay, now I did do the movie review already last year, and I know I, I actually said William Graham. <laughs> yeah, forgive me for that. Sometimes I get really tired that I get mixed up with names, so forgive me for that. But this just looks amazing that they did this. Uh, you can see the back too, where you see Hannibal Lecter, that's played by Brian Cox on on the side too. So it's identical right there and um, wow <laughs> it's a two this set one is uh, the theatrical cuts which has um, Will Graham and the other one is the director's cut which has Hannibal Lecter and underneath it is it's the same as the slip cover so I don't need to show it so we already know this, and which, by the way, in the back, you, know, you can see the Tooth Fairy. Now, when I did the review of the film, I had the previous Blu-ray of this movie, which is on this cover art that MGM put out uh, back in 2011. Even though this is a 2009 release that came directly from the Hannibal Lecter collection. And yes, th this is basically one of the most ugliest cover arts they ever chose, but, you know, MGM just wants to be doing this on the cheap just to make it look very scary. But, but you know, that, that's why I prefer the original uh, theatrical poster and, and the one that Shelf Factory just chose, as I just showed right now. So, anyway. And then you see in the spine where... It's all stapled up to, yeah, right here, and then <laughs> on the back as well, you see this, 
and then of course uh, the disc is like this all in standard white with the words Manhunter in red that's what it looks like I know on the copyright it actually says 1990 Castle Rock Entertainment which I know it's weird because this movie came out in 1986 and it's not released from Castle Rock Entertainment it's released by De Laurentiis Entertainment Group which is um, part of uh, Studio Canal image yeah it even says it on the copyright right there I can get right close it um, now there's a slight difference between this release and the Screen Factory release was well it is the same transfer as the MGM release with the theatrical cut the audio they have the DTS HD master audio for 5.1 but they also have 2.0 as well so they're both in English and their subtitles is in English as well but this release only includes the same audio as this release but they also have Spanish and French 5.1 Dolby Digital with subtitles uh, that are both in English and Spanish so and and I guess also the difference with the uh, the MPEG-4 AVC uh, Kodak for the theatrical cut was that basically they took the the same transfer as before it, but this time it looks a little warmer but for those who have this release and now bought the new release I guess it's best to uh, not hang on to it so I'm, I am going to keep this release anyway because you know like if if I had to go for the languages and all that I figured why not plus you know just to see the difference between the two even though they're both identical to each other so that's on the disc one and has tons of features right here too it has uh, new interviews with director of photography Dante Spinotti a very good cinematographer because he actually created all the shots in, in the movie where um, he loves to use jails all the way around the room like the scene where inside the bedroom of Will Graham's house where you get to see uh, baby blue uh, gels all the way into the window so it actually shoots um, some blue lights all the way through the bedroom so I thought it looks really cool the way they shot that because you know Michael Mann loves to do all of his stylish work in all of his films so it's great to see that he got his uh, cinematographer to do all of those shots and he also added some green gels on onto the uh, the dark rooms of of uh, Reba's house and they even had other um, neat color temperature scenes uh, a beautiful shot of the beach uh, even the shots that were that were sunsetting and and uh, sun rising too on you know inside the the rooms and even outside too like when they went inside Francis Dollahide's uh, really nice house that he has you know he has his old room uh, set up you know where he has a projector a lot of pictures all around like he has a picture of a full moon and a picture of of the red dragon and all of that that's in there yeah everything it just it just looks amazing and he definitely explained it in full detail you know how having to use these shots so it looks really nice and I love that interview also uh, new interviews with uh, William Peterson and yeah it was great to see him looking very older now I mean he's in his 60s now so you can tell how old he looks so he doesn't look like his young self like he was in the movie so he has white hair now, uh, has wrinkles like crow's feet on his eyes. Yeah, that's how I can fully explain. He basically talks about um, how he did the film because, well, at the time he was doing the movie To Live and Die in L.A. That was his first film, even though he had a small role in Thief, the, the Michael Mann movie. So he chose him to do Manhunter, which at the time was called Red Dragon. But he also explained that he was actually working on the movie Heat, yeah, which hard to believe he was actually working on that uh, in the early 80s, you know, 
which apparently will turn out to be called uh, L.A. Takedown, which is will soon become the movie Heat with uh, Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, which I really love, of course. That's a good movie. And also he explains about the, the climax in the movie, and yes, that's one of my favorite moments, was that, believe it or not, he even says that they didn't have the special effects crew to do those shots because unfortunately they left before they had a chance. He said that uh, that when he did that scene, he didn't meet uh, Tom Noonan until the final climax where he just jumps into the window of his house, into the kitchen, just ready to uh, grab him, just when the Francis Dalhai was about to uh, stab Weba you know, by using a shard of glass and then he and then by the time uh, Francis had grabbed him he actually uh, slashes his face and then and threw him all the way into the refrigerator and he was knocked down unconscious which apparently this is a true story he was rushed to the hospital because of those stitches that he had so they had to add some stitches on his face but also keep the makeup on so that way it'll be left intact as long as it doesn't get affected because they wanted to use that shot for the movie so that's kind of a shame that this happened but it's, it's, it's interesting to hear the story about that because I would imagine they, if they did use um, actual uh, special effects uh, for this shot alone so they had to do like old school filming that he explained and then What's interesting was that because um, Michael Mann decided to use um, some picnic blood, yeah, so he had to get a lot of supplies to actually create this scene, and added all the 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 bottles and all this other stuff. And, and the fact that they did the shot where Will Graham was about to shoot um, Francis, and suddenly they said they actually use a ketchup bottle and they use it into a tube. So they can blow out all the blood that's coming all the way from Francis when he got shot. And then by the time he finally got shot and killed, um, yeah, Francis was on, yeah, which of course Tom Noonan, actually had to lay on, on the ground with picnic blood um, appearing. And I also heard that in the interview for Tom Noonan, he even explains that he was uh, stuck inside the floor with pigment blood for a while, like like I think an hour when they shot that. So that was like, wow. Interesting filmmaking here. It's like they, and he even said it, it's like a student film. So, so they actually use old school uh, special effects <laughs> that you can do on your own. So I thought that was interesting that they didn't use the special effects crew to do this shot. Yeah, that's another reason to love this climax. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, yep, there's Tom Noonan in, in the interview, as well as uh, Joan Allen. And now Tom Noonan's a good choice, too, because he even explained that um, the main reason why he got the role to play Francis Dolahide was because, get this, uh, producer D Dino De Laurentiis, um, had hired him to do a film as we speak to do I believe a small role for the movie Maximum Overdrive now I know Tom Noonan did work on another film that's also from the same producer in another film uh, with Jay Leno and uh, Pat Morita called um, Collision Course yeah, which I reviewed that by the way and he played the, the villain in that movie yeah, so I guess it's interesting that um, yeah, so it was it's, so it was like after Maximum Overdrive that he got the role to play Francis Dolahide in, in the movie right here. So it's really cool. But they also explain about the um, the Red Dragon tattoo that he had right here. Yeah, it's also on the Blu-ray uh, cover art that I have in the back. They were actually going to use that um, in the movie. They were going to use the Red Dragon tattoo, but sad to say, uh, he felt that it just doesn't work. So, but that's sad because it actually trivialized um, 
the idea because it's from the book. So they should have included the the um, the red dragon tattoo. But I know they they had to go for budget restraint. And Tom Noonan also explained about the original ending to the Red Dragon book, and which I know you'll, you'll probably see that in the 2002 version of the movie. Yeah, of course, because <laughs> I have that too. Um, but they had to do the changes because of the budget restraint. Yeah, I mean, Daniel De Laurentiis was just uh, was just an Italian producer who just has his own small production company that's in North Carolina. Because that's where he took over the studio, which will, which will soon become bankrupt. So there you go. Yeah. And in the Joan Allen's uh, interview, uh, Joan Allen also explained that she's also from Chicago, because she actually does a lot of plays, uh, you know, with um, all those actors. Um, which they also mentioned uh, actor uh, Dennis Farina, who's no longer with us. He got the role in the movie. Because he was still a Chicago police officer, and then, and he will soon become an actor when he did the TV series Crime Story, and that's how it remains. She was talking about the scenes, um, uh, about the movie where she was talking about that tiger scene that where they had a trainer sedated the, the tiger, but they didn't want to put too much uh, sedatives because it'll kill him. So they, they use that, that particular scene, which, I know, it kind of gets to me, too, because it's, it is a very uncomfortable scene, but it was very interesting to see that scene where, where you see uh, Joan Allen, who played Reba in the film, as a blind lady who was just about to uh, feel uh, the tiger, um, feel his heart beating, and uh, actually uh, feel um, his fur and and his teeth too and all of that even though uh, the tiger is moving a little bit and breathing too so it's like wow I mean that's gotta be something right there See, that, that's actually the best scene in, in the movie Manhunter that I love and there's also uh, new uh, interviews for the music of Manhunter which they have interviews with composer Michelle Rubini Barry Andrews, um, which, who's uh, the lead singer of Streetback, and Gary Poonam, uh, lead singer for The Prime Movers, also Rick Schaffer for The Reds, and Gene Stasha for Red 7. So yeah, because they did the music for the movie. Yeah, because there, there are a lot of great songs uh, for the soundtrack, and they actually chose a lot of that just to keep... Uh, the film uh, as as a perfect place to it because you know Michael Mann at the time was doing the TV series uh, Miami Vice because he's been known for putting all the the wonderful music scores and all these other type uh, music that they chose for the series because yeah it is a crime drama as well but it's that's set in Miami so it just looks like it's it's a music video <laughs> in a way so. And he's very good at doing that in a very stylish way. So, I, it, and it's great to listen to the interviews and the composers right there because it just they fully explain how they managed to get the music in there and how it fits perfectly. So, just wonderful. Yeah, it has a theatrical trailer, which is cool because that should have been included on the MGM release if they had to go for bare bones. And, but that's good because I'm glad it's included because that's the best trailer that they ever had for the film. It, they show you all the good shots of, of the movie right there. And uh, they also have the still gallery which just shows um, pictures of, of the film with all the characters, the movie posters, all of that. It's just amazing. This too is the director's cuts that's in HD by the way but they added the, the standard definition inserts so what they did was they took the MGM transfer which is from this one by the way <laughs> it's also on here too and they added um, the standard definition clips and they spliced it together into one 
high definition master of the film and that's from the Anchor Bay release of course and it's not perfect because what happened was the standard definition inserts they put into the uh, high definition master is that it's all interlace every clip that's inside there is all interlaced it just doesn't look very good at times and apparently e even in its standard format it, it didn't look that great because well it was taken from the 35 millimeter master that they kept those shots in which didn't seem like it was taken care of very well because it wasn't fully clean so, so they had some issues not to mention the sound quality is in mono, so you could tell that it didn't sound like it's in uh, full stereo like you were hoping it would be. Because the movie was shot in Dolby Stereo, so it's supposed to sound in, in mostly in stereo than mono. But it's, but it's interesting that uh, Shell Factory had to put um, all these uh, standard footages in there in order to make it. But it's just sad that you know we won't be able to get a proper master of all the uh, the deleted scenes that's cut into and put inside the, the high definition master that they could have had but I guess it's the best they could ever have for the director's cut they're still missing a few scenes here and there that's actually from the TV version that aired on the movie channel a long time ago in fact they even had the deleted scene where it, where uh, Will Graham enters uh, Dr. Chilton uh, before he was about to meet um, Hannibal Lecter inside the white cell so uh, that, that's a shame um, also I, I forgot to mention that the, the theatrical version also has uh, an, in, an interview with uh, Brian Cox and yeah he, he explained how he got the role of Hannibal Lecter because uh, because his friend uh, Brian Dennehy was going to take the role for for him, but as well as all the other actors um, before him, so he finally got the role because he was doing uh, plays and and some movies uh, in the UK before he came here to America to do that shot, which has only had six minutes of footage, <laughs> but his interview is only forty minutes. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, I'm glad you know he gets more uh, screen time to. To fully explain the the role that he chosen for. So um, now back to the director's cut. They they also um, included the standard definition that's from the Anchor Bay release because well they figure if just to see some different options. So like if you don't want to see the uh, the HD version, you can watch the standard version to see the difference here. Because then you notice that uh, that the standard definition, which it is interlaced of course where the picture quality doesn't look all scrunchy the way they did it for Shell Factory, so yeah. But that's the only way to go. It's sad, but that's just the only way they had to go for the director's cut. I still kind of wish that Shell Factory had added the deleted scenes uh, from the, the the movie channel uh, release, but if, if someone actually had access to it, like if someone could actually post more of those scenes, um, that would have been awesome. And Apparently, I, I wish Shell Factory actually had done something like that by finding the that deleted scene of, of Dr. Chilton where, where Will Graham enters uh, on YouTube because, you know, Shell Factory had did this before when they found an episode of Hey Dude. You know, I'm being slightly off topic here, but when he did, uh, but Shell Factory did that because they couldn't find a high quality uh, master print of the same episode. So they figured this is the only way to go, despite the fact that the BHS uh, quality looks, you know, not very good. But it's the best they could try, so there you go. <laughs> so it's not all clean up or anything. That's another reason why they did this. But it's good that they include the director's cut, because I always wanted to see in a whole different way. But I wish there were a couple more scenes that they would have left in to make the movie look e even better. But that's okay. Because I, I love the theatrical cut, it just it, it definitely shows exactly what they were going for. Yep, it also has the audio commentary by writer director Michael Mann. Because uh, yeah, since he wrote the screenplay for the film too, 
that's based on the book uh, Red Dragon by Thomas Harris. That's from the Anchor Bay release, by the way, as you can tell. Um, also, all the extras from that release, uh, the Manhunter look with a conversation with cinematographer Dante Spinotti, Inside Manhunter with stars William Peterson, Joan Allen, Brian Cox, and Tom Noonan. Yeah. So it's all in there on this uh, wonderful set. And I really love this set too. I think this is a very good set that Shelf Factory definitely did justice to this film because it really deserves this. And not only that, but this is actually perfect to actually do this uh, release in honor of its 30th anniversary. So, and it, it got released back in May, so there you go. <laughs> Perfect timing right there, so that's good. So I, I'm glad Shelf Factory released this. Because so, already they're about to release tons of titles that's part of the collector's edition. Both Shelf Factory, Shout Selects, and Screen Factory. So they got all their labels so, all put up. So, yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm very excited for the release of Dreamscape. Because that's finally coming out uh, later in December. And I really would love to get that released too. Because I never owned the previous release that came out on Blu-ray uh, back in 2010 by Image Entertainment. Which I heard the transfer isn't the best. It's all interlaced in a way. It only had a few extras here and there. Yeah, they call themselves a special edition. But it only gets a few extras. So, <laughs> no kidding. But don't worry. I mean, the... I, I could tell for sure that they're going to get a much better transfer this time around. And and then they're going to add some more features, new extras, and all of that stuff to make it look even better than ever. Yeah, so. But either way, definitely get this release. If you love the film, I highly recommend it. And... <laughs> Because this one could definitely blow this release away, but if you want to keep it for the uh, the languages and all that, then why not? But if you want to sell it or or just just for this release alone, I think it's worth it. Plus, um, the movie did look a lot sharper, you know, with the edge enhancement and all that. But it it gives it um, a higher compressed movie compared to uh, this release, because this is a 50 gig. Blu-ray, so still, even though it's bare bones, but definitely get uh, Manhunter on Blu-ray uh, from Shell Factory. It would definitely be worth it. I actually got this release at Best Buy for four sixty. Hard to believe four sixty because it was on sale for nineteen ninety nine. But we had to use the Best Buy Rewards, because we had a Best Buy Rewards card from the credit card that we have. And it lowered down the price to four sixty, so now we got it at a very good price. Thank God. <laughs> but it's definitely worth it. Anyway, so that's my Blu-ray review of Manhunter. And <laughs> it's excellent. So I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.